Prime Minister, thank you very much for having us here, as Mike said. Um, thank you for putting up with us. Thank you for putting up with me yet again. Um, well, thank you for coming and thank you for doing the dialogue again. It's about our fourth or fifth. It is, yeah, we've, we we've can't talked before. We can't meeting like this. Um, we, we are occasionally witnessed. Um, let's begin, I think we might begin with the international scene then come on to COVID and Singapore precisely. Um, just to begin with, China and the US. Earlier this year, or late last year, you called for a truce. And I wondered, does the past week where we've seen the deal about COP, the deal about climate change, and we've now seen Xi and Biden talk, does that amount to the truce that you asked for? I think it's a necessary beginning. Uh, the differences between the two countries are many and deep, and it goes beyond individual issues to basic mindsets. They are not going to be resolved or reconciled in one meeting or one deal. But it's good that the US and China could make some understanding at COPS. And it was crucial for the two leaders to be able to have this virtual meeting and speak frankly to one another. How would you describe those two, two different mindsets? What, what is the fundamental difference as you see it? Well, I think each. The two see the world in very different ways and see each other in very different ways. Uh, for the Americans, it's become a bipartisan and very strong consensus that China is uh, not just a potential threat, but a challenger and a serious problem for them, an opponent almost. I'm not saying the administration thinks like this, but I think it's a broad view in American society, at least the think tankers. And at the same time, that, that relationship with, the, with China is not just contesting strategic uh, balance which needs to be worked out, but has a moral dimension to it, right and wrong. I am democracy, you are not. I am for human rights, you are not. And if you define issues like this, it becomes very difficult to transition from that to saying I have to coexist, we both live in the same globe. On the Chinese side, I think there's a very settled view now amongst well, many of their uh, journalists, population, I imagine some of the leaders too, that um, America wants to slow them down and uh, stop their emergence, and that America regrets having helped them given them permanent MTN, uh, uh, permanent uh, multilateral uh, MFN, yeah. uh, allowed them into the WTO, facilitated investments, growth, and made them now where they are. And that's one. And secondly, I think there is a sense that China's time has come, and well, we shall take our rightful place in the world, which is quite understandable. But then how do you take your rightful place in the world in such a way that a very big player leaves space for many not quite so big players? And that's a sensitivity and an art which uh, doesn't naturally, doesn't automatically come naturally. That, that mindset you described, this sort of, this problematic mindset, does it also involve China's time has come and America's is going? Yes, there is that part as well. I mean, there is a strong sense that uh, the East is rising and America and the West is uh, declining, and in particular, that America is a declining power. I think it's wrong. I can see what makes them think like that. Other people sometimes think like that, but if you take a long view, you really have to bet on America recovering from whatever things hap it does to itself. <laughs> Can we, can, we, can we look at one of those things it's, it's doing to itself at the moment? We heard from Gina Raimondo earlier um, at the conference where she is out here selling very eloquently the, the US Indo-Pacific economic framework. But you know what that is. It's a, it's a trade deal without a trade deal. It doesn't have a trade deal at the back of it. And I suspect that people like Singapore would much rather that the TPP, now called the CPTPP, um, was back. Well, America is, America is trying to sell something that is hard for you to 
naturally gravitate towards. These are the realities of politics. The TPP would have been the ideal approach. It took America some time to come to that, to decide that this was the way it wanted to engage the region, and to push for this flagship substantial project, which would not only show, but actually be a deepening of America's engagement and relationship with Asia. And uh, Mr. Obama uh, personally adopted it. He, he's put a lot of time pushing the leaders and making uh, the negotiations make progress. But I think what he did not do or, or judge that it was not possible to do was to push it enough domestically and in Congress. Mm. And in the end, he ran out of time and it was not possible to smuggle it through a lame duck Congress. And anyway, uh, Hillary also disavowed it. And when uh, Mr. Trump won, that, that was the end of the matter. And you are now in a position where that's dead. I'm not saying it can't be resurrected, but resurrection doesn't happen after three days. Yeah. <laughs> not after three years either. Or three years even. So therefore, what does America do if you can't do that? Well, you still need to be able to engage with a substantive agenda. And if I can't do that, I can talk about digital cooperation. I can talk about green cooperation. I can talk about you know, human resource cooperation. One piece is missing, but at least I'm not missing from the field of the engagement. You're, you're very compassionately talking about it from the perspective of the seller, but you're actually the buyer. You are the person who has to decide whether this is a good or bad thing. You, do you still think it's something that's useful? I think it can be useful. I mean, we are pitching the idea of um, digital engage, uh, digital economy uh, uh, agreement with the US, uh, with some grouping of the APEC countries, and we hope the US will participate in this. Um, it's not so easy for a Democrat administration to do because the administration has come in promising to look after the middle class in the US. And everything needs to link back to that. Well, actually, everything will ultimately link back to that. Yeah. But if you insist on a direct and immediate connection, you may miss out on many indirect but valuable projects, such as this one. What about the China is now applying to join the CPTPP? So is Taiwan, for yes. what it's worth. Yes. How, how do you assess the chances of either of those or both of those joining it? Well, the way the CPTPP was constructed was that it would welcome anybody who would come along and meet its quite high standards and the spirit thereof. And I, I think when China expressed an interest, it was, with the TPP, the idea was we have this grouping well, one day it's conceivable China would be interested. And it's more likely that you can have a deal between the US and China in a TPP framework than th that the US and China bilaterally make an yep. FTA. And I think both sides were coming around to considering that. Even the Chinese who initially poo pooed this and this is meant to fix us, then they decided to study it and then eventually uh, they, they think these, about these things for a long time. Eventually, they said, well, perhaps we should take an interest in it. Unfortunately, the Americans are not there now. So from the point of view of the economics, I think it can make sense. From the point of view of a process, uh, the decisions are made by consensus by all the CPTPP members. And when they look at it, it's not just economics which they look at but they will also consider the political considerations, the strategic and the security factors, and also uh, any bilateral issues and concerns which they may have been discussing. Oh. And so the South China Sea could become part of Well, the South China Sea is not a trade issue, but there are also trade issues between yeah. the APEC countries or the TP CPTPP countries and uh, China. So I hope they can work it out. I think in the long term, it's good to have more trade rather than less trade. I still believe that, although it's not quite so fashionable now. And I hope that these things can be worked out in a way which uh, enhances the stability and the integration in the Asia-Pacific. I mean, Singapore has always been the great sort of 
benefactor or beneficiary of multilateralism. What was interesting this morning is we had Wang Shishan giving a, an address. Yes. And he probably mentioned the word multilateral or multilateralism about yes. 20 times. Yes. This new China coming towards you, bearing gifts, promising that it's multilateralist, do you believe in that? No, I think it is the right thing for them to say and the right thing for them to try to do. I mean, if China came along and said, I'm a unilateralist, you would take it amiss. Yeah. But if it, claims, so if, if it claimed to be a multilateralist... If it claims to be a multilateralist, they do want to join all these organizations. In fact, they would like to vote some of their people to lead these organizations. I mean, there have been some uh, UN organizations where yes. uh, fierce contests have taken place. And they'd like to influence the rules in these organizations, all of which is legitimate because they are a considerable power and they want to have uh, commensurate influence in the world. The question is, how do you make it truly multilateral after a very major power has joined the group? And um, in principle, the five principles of coexistence, as big or small, we are all equal. But in practice, in the UN, everybody knows that some countries are more equal than others. So it could be a kind of an elephant in the room, so to speak. It could be the, much bigger than all the other partners. Yes, and you have to have... You have to engage the power, and the power also has to have some self-awareness that this is the way I operate, which will ensure my acceptance and therefore a continuation of my influence without resorting to brute force. And has China yet reached that point of thinking that way, in a way that you could imagine them sitting beside you and, and treating everyone as somewhat equal? Well. No big power treats everyone as somewhat equal, <laughs> but some do, so, some do so better than others. They do it more politely. What would, but just going back... No, no, I wouldn't say more politely. You look at the Americans. They've been in Asia-Pacific since the war, at least. I mean, they were the, Pacific, the Philippines even before that. But to be, after 70 or 80 years, still welcome in a region and not just be seen as an ugly American, tells you there's something about this. What, what would it say about America's role in the region if China joins CPTPP and they, they do not? Well, if China joins CPTPP, America still has a role in the region. You have investments here, you have trade here, you have interests here, you have friends here, you have allies here. Yeah. And we hope that you, amidst your many far-flung preoccupations all around the world, you have time to cultivate uh, a, a part of the world which may not squeak so loudly, but which is valuable and a profitable relationship. But if you were Joe Biden, what would you do to change that balance? I mean, it's, it sounds from what, everything you've said that America needs to do slightly more in this region than it is doing so far. I think, uh, first, I would try to move on trade. You can't do it an FTA, but you, you do want to move forward on trade, even despite the uh, Democratic Party roots. Secondly, to develop the relationship with China, because if that relationship is sour, it's much harder for every other country in the region. Thirdly, don't stop with China. Also, cultivate your other friends in the region and allies. And I think the, la the second part uh, Biden is trying to do, it's a long journey, but he's starting. The friends and allies, his approach is quite clear, and I think people do believe that. The last thing he can do is to ensure a president after 2024, whichever party of like mind. That, that is sadly not in his... Not it's in not his within giving. his giving, but that is something which is very important. You must be able to look beyond because America's interests extend well beyond 2024. One, one uh, last question on that is Taiwan. How, how much should we worry about what is going to happen there? I think we should be concerned. I don't think it's going to war overnight, but this is a situation where you can have a mishap or a miscalculation and be in a very delicate situation. Uh, the leaders, the countries all say the right things. Uh, in this virtual summit this morning, Joe Biden said, well, the U.S. will uphold its one China policy, and he also talked about the Taiwan Relations Act, which is long-standing. Uh, Xi Jinping said, uh, we are not in a hurry to solve the cross-straits problem. 
effects. It's a code word, but everybody knows yes. what it means. And in Taiwan, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen says, uh, we ask everybody to maintain the status quo. So everybody says the right thing. But if you look at what is happening, it is not a static situation. The US has significantly increased the visibility, the level, and the intensity of engagements, diplomatic engagements, even military engagements with Taiwan. Uh, China has been testing Taiwan's air defenses. It flies aeroplanes into Taiwan's air defense identification zone almost daily. It doesn't go into the, intrude into its sovereign airspace or air, its immediate airspace, but it's testing Taiwan's defenses and tightening up on international space, which was prepared to concede Taiwan even five or seven years ago. And on the part of Taiwan, the, this uh, DPP administration has disavowed the 92 consensus, which was to each its own interpretation, and it says, no, that's not the, an acceptable formulation. And taking other steps, for example, printing on their passports in English, Taiwan passport. Mm -hmm. So all these moves raise suspicions and tensions and anxieties and make it more likely that a mishap or miscalculation can happen. And really, if you want, you want to step back some, uh, and de-escalate de is too strong a word, but uh, chill <laughs> a little bit, and think how, how, how much you would regret losing this if you tried the alternatives which came. Do you really think China feels that way? Do you think it would, it, it, surely, the, if the alternative, is it controlling Taiwan? Is no, I think, th I think that if they were quite clear that uh, the situation was stable and things would not gradually drift against them, they would be more relaxed about taking time to see how things evolve. Uh, but the difficulty is if they fear that things may be drifting away from them. And uh, not away from them economically, because economically, I think they're going to become more and more a big factor in Taiwan's economy. But in terms of the attitudes of people on, in Taiwan, in terms of the um, uh, international environment, well, then they may decide that perhaps uh, uh, later may become more complicated. So I don't think that it's a matter where they, they want to solve it straight away, but how do I deal with a very difficult problem? I mean, they've got Hong Kong is already a very difficult problem. Hong Kong, just seeing you mentioned it, just quickly on that, do you see Hong Kong as something that will, China will increase its authority over? There's been a I, tightening of restrictions there. Well, as you I, think, I think what was happening in Hong Kong before uh, last year uh, was, it was very hard to imagine that it could continue until 2047 mm. oh, for, for, for 50 years. It's not possible. You can't govern a place like that. You can't pass the laws. You can't, the government's writ doesn't run. And there's the risk of contagion across the one country, two systems border. So they are now in a situation where that problem has been very firmly put down. I think that there's a price which has been paid internationally and even internally in Hong Kong. And uh, I think they will see how things evolve from there. I don't think they need, they, they wish to or want to make it uh, the same as any other Chinese city. That makes it unvaluable to them because they've got many other prosperous Chinese cities. Hong Kong is different. That's why it was valuable. But how different can it be without posing an intolerable problem on the other side of one country, two systems. That was the difficulty. How much is Hong Kong's loss, Singapore's gain? I suppose some people may decide they prefer to be in one place than the other, but overall, uh, I have no doubt that Singapore is much better off if Hong Kong is prospering and we do business with them and compete with them. That sounds a bit like Paris talking about London at the moment. But. Well, it certainly doesn't sound like London talking about Paris. <laughs> <laughs> How does, 
there are there are similarities. Um, <laughs> slightly, can we look turn a little bit towards Singapore and COVID? Um, because you've been, we've all lived through this. We've all lived through it for the past couple of days. Um, you said in October that you would relax or think about relaxing restrictions in three to six months, roughly. So that on that time scale, the earliest would be January. And it's worth remembering the audience, uh, reminding the audience here that in Singapore, generally, people are living under tighter restrictions. And we have very generously from you for, for this conference, people are only allowed to meet two at a time and things like that. But is, is January still a sort of... We'll have to see how, how things evolve. It's possible. The, the thing is this. We are trying to reach the end point without paying the high price which many other societies have paid, which got infected before they got vaccinated. We kept uh, COVID very low in Singapore until we had everybody vaccinated. We had hoped that after nearly everybody got vaccinated, then you have herd immunity, and theoretically, well, uh, life goes back to normal. But with the Delta variant, you may have everybody vaccinated, and you still have quite a lot of people getting infected, which for most people who are young is fine, but for a significant proportion of the old who are not vaccinated. You have, you have these sort of 60,000 people it's a problem. who seem to... I have 61,000 people who are 60 and above who are not yet jabbed. They refuse to take it. No, I'm, I don't think that they're refusing. They're coming. Every day, a couple of hundred still come. Uh, some of them are very infirm and perhaps bedridden. We go and jab them if they are willing and their families are willing. Some of them, their families may have uh, reservations about uh, uh, whether their constitution can take it, but we tell them... I'm not sure their constitution can take COVID. But they are anxious, so we, uh, we understand that. Some of them say, mRNA, is it safe? I'm so old. Well, all right. So now we have got some non-mRNA vaccines on the menu, and they can do that if they want to. So gradually, we will cover them. But what the, because of our strategy, we have not had the very big outbreaks and that the British or many of the European countries or the Americans have had. And I'm now at a point where I've had most of the population vaccinated, but most of the population is COVID naive. And it turns out that's not enough. But, and we are having COVID spread in our population. Every day, there are about, today, there are about 3,000 cases. Yeah. Probably times three, you councils, which you didn't see. And over a period of months, those numbers will build up, and if you've been vaccinated and then infected after that mildly, I think your chances of being sick again are much less. And COVID will, I hope, uh, spread much less virulently, and we can progressively ease up. What I'm trying to do is to ease up a little bit, make sure things stabilize, ease up a bit more, make sure things stabilize again, and ease up a little bit more. And eventually, eventually you probably will not be back to status quo ante, but close enough and without having had to make unsettling U-turns. If I have Freedom Day, and after three weeks, uh, cases flare up and I have to tighten up, uh, it's very upsetting to the population. It's confusing. They will be frustrated, disappointed. And you may well pay a price along the way, human price. So I think it's better we take it step by step. I'm not absolutely certain that I can do this without any misstep. I may have to step on the brakes again from time to time, but that's my game plan. Isn't this the problem of governments all the way around the world? I mean, you, you are, by most measures, a very trusted government, but basically you face this problem between sending a clear message and then the fact that the message has to change on the, on the basis of... The yes, that, that is a problem. I mean, because with COVID, the science changes, the virus changes, the situation changes. You, you keep on finding yourself in a new situation, and each time you think you are at the end of the road, another hill appears ahead of you. And you've got to keep people energized and motivated and believing that, yes, it's worth making this journey. We will get there. So what does it mean? I think first, 
it means you should do your duty. Do what is right, do what you judge necessary, consult the public health, public doctors, consult the public health people, judge the, the political and the social outcome you want in terms of the balance, health care, economy, social cohesion, make the decision and let the opinion polls go hang. And it's your job to see the country through. Secondly, when things change, you have to change along with it. Because if you can't change along with it, you'll be out of step. And that's very hard. Because we started off with COVID zero practically, meaning I see a case, I will stamp on it, and if I need to trace 200 or 500 people to do that, I will try and do that. Not quite like in China where one case means one city lockdown, but quite stringently. Now I'm not doing that. Now I'm saying the, let the cases go, but let's keep the vulnerable people safe. You don't worry those 61,000 people are sort of driving the whole policy that Singapore could open up more? Well, but those 61,000 people have more than 61,000 relatives and friends and near and dear ones. And if you just write them off, I, I, I don't think you can make those utilitarian calculations. You've, it's a human cost. I mean, you just look at, look at what's happened in Britain or in Italy or in America. Sometimes it's by policy, sometimes it's by, it's by accident. But the, the terrible trauma the society goes through when you have people who are sick, whom you can't treat, who die waiting for oxygen or waiting for a bed. I would much rather not to have to do that. But rather interesting, you mentioned China. China is almost the outlier now. You had a group of countries, you had Singapore, you had Australia, New Zealand, who took a very strong and, as you pointed out, very successful approach to stamping out COVID. But we had no choice in the long term. Right from the beginning, I told our people we can't keep our borders closed indefinitely. Because we make a living from doing business with the world. And if people can't travel to Singapore, if goods can't ship through Singapore, we are dead. But China is now, the interesting thing about China, China is now very much saying we're going to keep things but locked But China is 1.4 billion people. I'm Slightly five and bigger. a half million. And they, they, they can make domestic tourism forever and not exhaust the destinations. They don't have to have cruises. You have cru a rather wonderfully cruises. I can only nowhere. cruise to nowhere. <laughs> these, these, for the un these for the uninitiated are the remarkable thing where you get on a cruise ship and you go off look at a few tankers and then come back. Much, much Well, well in the old Vegas. days, they didn't look at the few tankers. They went down to the casino and had a good time. <laughs> but, 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 all but, the same. but therefore, to come back to this. But China, China has actually been quite you know, rude implicitly about you, about Australia, New Zealand, saying you're opening up too quickly. No, well, we are in different situations. I mean, in the long term, I do not know how it will turn out for China because uh, they can ma maintain this for some time, but this virus is a very uh, contagious one and very difficult to manage, as we've all found. But for now, it's working for them. It's their judgment. But for us, we've had to change course, and we've had to carry the population along and persuade people that it is necessary for us now to accept a few thousand cases a day, and that it's, we will try our best, but there will be casualties and there will be mainly old people who will not make it through. And it's just like, it's just the way life is and it's the way influenza and pneumonia and other diseases carry off old folks by the thousands every year. But it's, we accept that. And we have to manage this going forward without letting it go out of control. And that's why I say trust is critical. Because finally, it's not my logic which persuades people, but they, they watch you, they listen to you, they either have confidence in you and faith in you, or they decide, well, he sounds good, but I'm not following him. They go off on a cruise to nowhere. Can I, can I ask you about a sort of personal question on the end of that? You have, you've said that you will stay on until COVID is under control. You'll stay on as prime minister. Some journalists have noted that you have, however, cleverly put two of your potential successors onto the COVID task force to see how they do. It looks a little like kind of squid game. Do you, do you, do you have any, do you have any idea? How, how are they performing? Are, they, are you thinking of eliminating them or continuing? I, I think our, our approach is not to have 
not to write off any participants because <laughs> I don't have spare. I'm not looking for a winner. I'm trying to build a team. And the team needs many different skills and many different people to carry a very heavy responsibility of taking Singapore into the next generation beyond me and my age group of leaders. And I think they each make a contribution and I put them there not, not as a beauty contest, but because I think they can make a contribution and it's a very important job which needs to be done. And if I don't put the best people available on the COVID team, what am I doing with them? I will take that as a sign that they're still in the competition. Um, <laughs> can, can we move on to that part of that inheritance, which is the economy? And I wondered how, you know, you are, you are here, you're facing rising prices. It's the big debate everywhere I look out and see heads of investment banks also worrying about this. Inflation, what does that mean for Singapore and how worried are you about it? So far, it's been close to zero for quite a number of years now, sometimes plus one, sometimes zero, some years even negative occasionally. It looks like it's catching up now. The, the, the central bankers tell us not to worry, it is transient, and that they are tapering off very gradually, and then things will be all right again. But meanwhile, they want to push inflation up to something which is good for them, like 2%, and push inflation expectations up mm. to 2%, because then they've got room to do conventional monetary policy again, and the economy will work better. I hope they are right, but it's very difficult to tell about these things. In Singapore, up to now, we have not seen a very high spike like in America. I think their last number, they had 5 or 6%. Yes. Very sharp. Uh, I, our, our most recent forecast for the year, maybe we have one and a half, maybe 2% this year. Uh, not negligible, but it's a trend which needs watching. Can I, can I talk about two, ask you about two forms of taxation that you are either thinking about or started that many other countries around the world are looking at? And the first is a carbon tax. Um, if you asked most economists, most business people, I would argue most people with a brain, about the best way to deal with global warming, they would say that you should tax carbon in the same way as you tax cigarettes and alcohol and other things you want to discourage. Um, the politicians in most countries have wimped out of that, certainly in America. You have tried a carbon tax. You've got one around $5. It's not, it's not a lot. Most people would say it should be higher. Yeah. But what would, you, what would you say to other people who are too timid to try this? Well, I've seen other people try this and be, pay the price for trying yes, this. So true. I don't go around advising other people. But all the same, tell us, tell us about Sing uh, Singapore. Well, Why? we decided that it is the sensible way in which to incentivize people to cut back on um, things which cause carbon emissions. To apply a carbon tax, and we wanted to apply it, apply it across the board to all major emissions. And that means um, if you are mostly manufacturing factory, if you are a big a plant producing a lot of carbon, well, we will calculate what you owe. Uh, and also, importantly, electricity generating uh, electricity uh, plants, because the GENCOs are running on natural gas, nearly all of them, and that, that generates CO2. And so we apply a carbon tax on them, and it feeds through into our electricity tariffs. Um, when it comes to petrol and diesel, we took the view that we already had an excise duty, which is substantial, particularly for petrol, and so we didn't add on an additional carbon tax. We just treated that as part of it. I think it's important to get started. If we want to incentivize change of behavior and usage, or even industry structure in the long term, it has to be significantly higher than that in order for us to reach the carbon targets which we have set for ourselves, which is to peak at 2030 and then to go down by, uh, oh, by half or something by 2050. And uh, once I've set a cap to my carbon emissions, I must decide whom to give these emissions to. Yeah. And either I charge you for them and you buy them from me, or I must make a decision to allocate. And this industry you have so much, and that industry, therefore, you have so much less. 
And this consumer, therefore, if all industries have more, the consumers, therefore, have even lesser. I think these choices cannot be avoided. There's only how best you can do it. It's and I think the carbon pricing is one element. And at $5, it's a token, but it can't stay at $5, and we've said we're reviewing it. There's an interesting thing you do here is that you, the money you raise from a carbon tax, you give back to consumers directly so they can see... Uh, we haven't done give, that with the carbon that. tax. We have said that we take the money and use that and more if necessary to incentivize carbon mitigation. Yes. Reduce carbon emissions. Improve your, 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 your standards. And that we have been willing to do. But in other areas, we do that. For example, we charge a lot of money for water in Singapore because it's a scarce and strategic resource. And uh, people pay the full price for water. It's now about $2.50 per cubic meter. Um, and it's affordable, but nevertheless, it was, is a lot more than it used to be before we made this system. So what we do, rather than subsidizing water or subsidizing consumption, we actually give people what we call a use safe voucher. In other words, it's, a, it's practically cash. I put it into your, into your utilities bill statement, so it offsets your water consumption or your electricity consumption. But if you don't use that water or electricity, well, the cash is basically yours. And it's not so easy to explain, but I think it's the right thing to do, and it has worked. Do you worry about a backlash against greenery in the same way as there's one against globalization? That yeah. people, people uh, thought that globalization was something that the elites liked. People now think that mitigating climate change is something that the elites support, but for most people it means more money on their utility bill, more money on their Yes, I think that's bill. entirely possible. You look at the yellow vest in, in uh, France, you look at what happened when the Australians tried a carbon tax several governments ago, uh, people will react. They, they, they want to save the planet, but when you tell them that means you have to pay more for electricity or that means you can't buy an SUV, you have to buy a compact, uh, that's a very personal implication. The other tax that you've been... And if you lose your job as a result because the industry is restructured and your petrochemical plant has to disappear, I, I, I don't think they'd be very comforted if you tell them next year global warming will be less. The other tax that you're looking at is a wealth tax. And as I understand it, you don't see this as a, a kind of temporary thing to deal with COVID. You see this as something structural that you want to look at I, taxing wealth in at least some way. Um, I think it's an element in a comprehensive revenue system. You tax consumption, you tax income, you tax uh, sins, and you, you should tax... Pro Wealth, whether wealth in the form of property, ideally wealth in other forms. Now, property taxes, we know how to do because we have them, we have refined them over the years, we've made them more progressive, and they make a valuable contribution to our uh, exchequer. Taxing wealth in other forms is very hard to do. You know in principle you want to do it. Uh, people have tried capital gains taxes, uh, that has some downsides. People have tried other forms of direct wealth taxation. I assess how rich you are and then knock off a certain percentage. Uh, it's not so easy to implement. So we will study this, but we need to find a system of taxation which is progressive and which people will accept as fair. And fair means everybody needs to pay some, but if you are able to pay more, well, you should bear a larger burden of the tax, and if you are, if you are uh, less well off, you should enjoy a greater, greater uh, amount of the government's um, support schemes and, 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 and benefits. But if you, it's the underlying problem this is in Singapore, you have been very good at dealing with in income inequality. But well, it's income inequality is inequality. somewhat easier to see compared and measure compared to wealth inequality because I can track your income and uh, our uh, Inland Revenue Authority has become very good at studying these things. Yeah. But wealth is much, much more difficult. It's amorphous. It's, it's, you can squeeze it here and it pops up in different forms elsewhere. Nowadays, you may have a non-fungible token. <laughs> yes. How do you know? Or Bitcoin. So it's not as easy to manage, 
but it is something which we do want to be worried about because we do, we would like to make sure that each generation starts off from as equal a starting point as possible. It's not possible to make it exactly the same, but within the limits of my ability, I will try to equalize if your parents uh, can't provide everything which, you would, which, which they need to for you. You don't worry that a wealth tax will scare away the wealthy. That wealth, on the whole, wealth taxes tend to, wealthy, the wealthy tend to be fairly good at avoiding them. Well, that is one of the worries, and that is one of the reasons why you have to think about this very carefully. Because uh, you've ha you have an agreement on a global minimum effective tax for companies. Yeah. I'm sure your clients have a view on that. And the idea is to equalize the playing field for, uh, for governments so that you don't have companies playing um, well, shell games. I, I, I move my income here, there, and we, sometimes you see it, then suddenly you don't. But I have no illusions that a 15% or 20 or 25% minimum effective tax rate is going to uh, stop governments from competing with one another to get projects which they want. And it, the competition will pop up in some other form. It's, unavoidable. And I think if you do wealth taxes, you may well come up with the same problem. You can, e you can examine the example of France, which has, had one or two problems when it hiked up its taxes very, very high. Well, they, they, there's a, uh, the French have, I've forgotten the name now, they, the French have a girl who is the icon of the country. Liberté. No, no, no. It uh, starts with M. The Marseillaise. Neither. It's a, it's a Marianne. Marianne. It's a Marianne. And the face changes because from generation to generation you update the, the person who is the model. But Marianne is a symbol of France. And this is about 20 years old, but Marianne decided to live in London because her taxes were lower. Lucy <laughs> <laughs> will be in the same position. Can I? I'm in the blissful position of all interviewers of having very few ideas exactly what the time is. <laughs> but I'm going to finish by asking you one, sort of finish in one particular theme. You know, look forward at Singapore as we go, uh, go forward. Imagine that somebody wins the Squid Game, whatever it is. You are somebody looking at Singapore in 10 years' time. How different is it? What are the, what, just ask you about two bits. One is that geopolitical sense. Do you see Singapore as stuck in a world with two economies, or one where there's still a big global economy? I think there'll be a global economy, but there'll be um, toll gates and all kinds of customs checks along the way, even swab tests. Because I don't see the rivalries disappearing, they could get worse, but neither is it possible for the Siamese twins to be separated. You are too interdependent on one another. And it is not possible to say, I make my own system and you make yours. You may be 1,400 million people, but you don't make everything in the world. And you may be the, big, the most powerful superpower on earth, but you need friends and partners. And you need to do business, if not on trade, on many other issues, with somebody whom you might consider not fully your friend. That's unavoidable. So there will be tensions, but I hope that there will, have be, there will still be peace. Can I ask you also on the sort of personal level, do you think that the way in which people work, this is a famous sort of entrepot, many people have huge offices here. Do you think that the way that people work, remote working, all those things, has that been a long-term legacy of COVID? There will be some of that. I know people who work in Singapore for American companies. Headquarter their boss is in San Francisco. There are people reporting to them. Uh, all over Europe, and they also have members of the team on the East Coast in the U.S. and in Canada. And, well, they have to get used to either European time zones or American time zones, so it's not that comfortable, but it is workable. And uh, I think that will grow, but I don't believe it is possible for you to build an organization without ever meeting face-to-face -face and pressing flesh. You have to have a feel of the person. I meet you, I sense you, the pheromones have to be there, then you know if he's fearful, confident, what sort of person is he or she. And you, you need to build a sense of camaraderie and teamwork. 
And those companies which operate in high in, 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 in skyscrapers will tell you that when you have different floors, the different floors form different cultures. And sometimes they make staircases to break through the floors in order to prevent these tribes from forming. Yes. So to not have a tribe by being all dispersed and uh, a spectral presence in cyberspace, I think in principle it's possible, but in practice it's not quite one team. One last thing, and that's in the 10-year vision. What, what do you see yourself doing? I hope I shall not be doing this job still. <laughs> <laughs> that seems a very appropriate place in which to stop. Prime thank Minister, you. Thank you very much for having us, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.